Well, happy Mother's Day. How many of you guys are thankful for the mothers out there? Amen? Woo! Let's give a round of applause. Well, you guys can stand up. Let's pray before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Uh, we just thank you, God, that it is Mother's Day, and we thank you for the mothers that you put in our lives. And even the, if we didn't have a good mother, we thank you that, uh, Lord, you're there. And thank you for the people, even in this church, that uh, can be like a mother and that can just show that love. And we just pray that we can show that love to them, that we can show that appreciation to them this morning. And, and first of all, we just want to turn our focus to you, God. We just want to thank you for all the blessings in our life. We want to thank you uh, even through the hard times that you uh, brought us through and even in the hard times that we know you, God, and that you are preparing a place for us, that you have given us so much more than we deserve already. And so we just want to praise you, God. We just want to uh, give you this day, give you this time of worship and continue to dedicate our lives to you. So I just pray that we can, uh, we can just look around, look in our lives and where we can surrender more to you and not where, uh, not think of different places where we can take more back, but instead where we can give more away, God, to others and to you. And so we thank you for this morning. Thank you for creating this day. And we just want to uh, give you the praise that you so greatly deserve. It's in Jesus' my name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
out on me Your love never fails and never gives up You never runs out on me Your love never fails and never gives up You never runs out on me song we're going to sing is called Come Away, and I kind of explained it on Wednesday night, but for those of you who aren't there, this song is kind of taken from the perspective of God, you know, kind of like when he says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I have a plan for you, and in this song it says, it's going to be wild, it's going to be great, and it's going to be full of me, so we're going to sing this, but it's kind of like the words of God, so just sing it out, and it might seem kind of weird to you at first but you know there's many different ways to worship right and and it's scriptural too so it's not like we're just singing random things but we're also going to have an opportunity to open up our hearts to him as well because he wants he wants that right he he knows that he's the best thing for all of us so he wants us just to open up our hearts and let him in amen
picture the Father right now, just looking upon the whole world, just saying, it's not too late, just come to me. Lord, I pray that we would have that burden to seek to give the new good news, God. sorry when we break your heart. We're sorry that when you come and you say, come away with me, that we ignore you at times. But we just want to listen to you right now. So I'll be here with you, God. give up, that we never think it's too late, or that it's not worth it. We know that you're always worth it, God. And we thank you that you paid the price so that we can live with you, God, that we can come to you boldly, God, not out of pride, but because you have covered us with your blood, you have washed us with your blood, God. Thank you for that gift. I just want to open up our hearts to you, God. Thank you. 
Jesus, you endure my pain. Savior, you bore all my shame. All because of your love. Maker of the universe. Broken for the sins of the earth. All because of your love All because of your love Because of your cross My debt is paid Because of your blood My sins are washed away Now
our hearts, God. God, I pray that you will just see if there's anything we're anxious or worried about. Anything that we've done that has offended you, God. I pray that you will just reveal that to us right now, God. And Lord, we know that there's so many people in this world that offend us, that they hurt us. They cause us to get upset. And Lord, we know that that isn't fun for us to deal with God, but I pray that you'll forgive us, God, for the times that we've offended you, the times that we've hurt you, God, the times that we've lied to you, God, even though we know you're always watching, you always see us, God. Lord, please forgive us. just pray right now that our hearts will be pure before you, God, that we will proclaim that we are found, that we are yours, that we are loved, that through you, God, that we are made pure. Lord, I pray that we will just accept that, God, accept that love. Sometimes it's hard to feel that love when everyone else around us, we feel like is hurting us, God. So right now, I, just for any of you maybe who didn't have a good mother or didn't even have a mother growing up, that God's saying right now that he even can be that mother for you. He's like that mother hen who just has his wings over you, that he's watching over you all the time, that he loves you, and he cares for you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what hurt or pain, that he's there for you and he loves you. So right now, I just encourage you to just surrender your heart right now to him. Cheers, my Thank you. 
Every time I wake up, she's always up before me, and she's always making breakfast, and always has a smile on her face, and she always gets out of her way to tell me she loves me and that she cares about me. She's always open to talk to me, and I know that she's the best mom in the world. I love my mom because she's taught me everything I've known, and she's 
loved me in times when I didn't want to love others? Well, there's a lot of reasons I love my mom. But one of the biggest reasons is because I see how selfless she is because she cares about other people and you always see her putting other people before herself. Mom, because she loves God more than anyone else and she really makes that clear. And I love my mom because she tells me I'm beautiful <laughs> and because she does so much for us and so much for the church. And I love my mom because she truly is a God-fearing and godly woman and Proverbs 31 woman as my mom. He said Jesus was here. He said that to be kind and caring. Um, she's taught me to love others and also to love God. How to take care of the baby and uh, my other siblings and family. The most important thing my mom has taught me is to persevere through trials with joy and with thankfulness and with faith in God that he will provide and that he will heal and that he will protect. And I don't know if I could really have learned it any better way than through watching my mom live her life with her eyes on Jesus. She's taught me how to, you know, no matter where you go, to preach the gospel and to share it with people. The most important things my mom has taught me is to talk loud and clear, look them in the eyes, shoulders, back personality. I think the main thing that I realize that my mom teaches us is that we really need to fear God, and fearing God means to not want to do anything that hurts his heart. She's gone through a lot of trials in her life, but she always chooses joy, and that's what she's taught me, to choose joy no matter what the circumstances. She is so strong. Like, my mom is the strongest woman I mean, One of the main things that she's taught me is to be joyful in every single circumstance, like it says in Philippians 4.12, to be content when you have much and when you have little, just to be content in all circumstances. So I'm really thankful for her teaching me that. I'm proud of my mom because she had a hard life growing up and she's raised me very well. Oh my, what makes me proud of my mama? If you know my mom, you know she is incredible. She is the strongest woman I know. She is so steadfast. She endures harder than anyone I've ever met. Nothing, nothing can stop her. Nothing can shake her faith. Nothing can take her eyes off her Savior. She's so, so faithful. And I know that the Lord just delights in her. And that makes me proud. I'm proud of my mom because like every time I see her, she's always talking to someone. And it's usually about the gospel. You know, it's sharing Christ with people. I'm really proud of her for raising us four kids. You know, mothers, maybe they want to like pursue their own career or their own dream, but it's really cool to see. It goes along with the selflessness where she's uh, given herself away and raised godly children. So yeah, I'm proud of her for that too. I'm thankful for my mom because she's always been there when I needed her. She's always let me cry with her. She's always been there to support me. She's good at sewing. <laughs> doing stuff around the house. And she is also really good at getting stuff done. Swords to kill the to kill bad guys. <laughs> She's good at cooking and making us breakfast and loving us um. and teaching us. <laughs> is she funny? No. no. <laughs> Me? <laughs> what makes my mom happy is when she sees us doing what God wants us to do and she, she does so many things for us and she loves when we're so happy about things. I love how my mom makes the little things so fun and special. I love being with her because she always makes it either funny or fun or just, just an adventure. I love her. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. I love her. She's special. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mom. I love you, Mama Mama. I want to be more like her and more bold about the gospel of Christ like she is. I love you, Mom. <laughs> so I love you. I want a popsicle. Good morning. Is that a good time of worship? Pretty good video, too. Good job, Anaya. That was awesome. We need to do more videos like that. That was great. Real quick, if you're a Bibles, 
I want to encourage you to turn with me to Titus chapter 2, that's in the New Testament. Titus chapter 2, it's before Hebrews. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. And the title of today's message is, Do You Have an Old Lady? Now I know on Mother's Day you're like, what is that? Do you have an old lady? Now let me explain it. We're going to see today that, how many remember, how many old hippies out there remember your old lady? Remember someone say, hey, how's your old lady? And that could mean your girlfriend, that could mean your wife, that could even mean your mom, an old lady. Well, we're going to see today that, uh, now you shouldn't call your mom or someone an old lady, but how many know that it's going to say that older women in the church should teach the younger women how to be godly? Amen. And it's also important that the younger women in the church welcome the older women to disciple or come alongside them. Amen? Can we get amen? You wait? Amen? Because how many know that we live in, they say, the most connected society of all times? I mean, we have internet, we can can talk to someone across the, the globe, but yet we're the most disconnected in the sense of relationship. How many know that? We text, we have Facebook, and how many know Facebook? I mean, you know, you know, if you've ever done online dating, I've never done it, but if you have, you know they're always so honest about their profile, right? Yeah. I think what they say, like 60, 70% of them are lying about all their stuff, because why? We always put our best face forward, our, butt, our best foot forward. We always try to look better than we are. And so I always think it's funny, I heard this, uh, Francis Chan, you ever heard of him? He says, this is amazing. Who would ever thought 20, 30 years ago you could have a page devoted to yourself to show all the pictures of yourself, to talk all about yourself, to say how great you are. <laughs> yep, we have that, right? Yep. I'm godly, I don't. Okay, I just went, I'm, just, I'm just teasing, just teasing. But, you know, it's pretty wild, right? I mean, now, I'm not saying that Facebook's the devil, but you know what I mean? It can be, and it can be that false relationship where we feel connected to so many people, but we're really not connected. How many could agree that we need to get better with one-on-one relationships? Yeah. Amen. And so that's what that means. Do you have an old lady? And what that means is I'm just saying that to grab you so you go, oh, lady, I'm not old lady. <laughs> but that you get it to see that you need that relationship. You need that. We need the older women to come alongside the younger women, and we need the younger women to be humble to say, I want to learn what God has taught you. Amen? As I always say, uh, a fool learns from his own mistakes, but a wise person learns from others' mistakes. And isn't that amazing? I was just telling a bunch of people this week that when David sinned with Bathsheba, he didn't say, oh, I've blown it sexually, so now forevermore I just got to let people just say, who am I to judge? Who am I to say anything? What did he say in Psalms 51? He says, now, Lord, I will teach transgressors your ways. Because why? He could say, here's what happened to me. He could say, when other kings were at war, I was on my palace being a little peeping Tom. I shouldn't have done that. I should have been doing the work of God. Amen? Amen? You guys are quiet today. You're scaring me. You're all tired out from Wake up. Hey, let's go. Woo! Wake it up. All right. So that's what that is. That's just the intro. Here it is. I want to read this to you. I don't know if this has anything to do with Mother's Day, but I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, some stats. It says, research shows that when both genders are present in the parenting role, children have the best opportunity for health, well-being, development, and success in life. As Dr. James Dobson notes, more than 10,000 studies have concluded that kids do best when they are raised by moms and by dads. Isn't that amazing? It's like the Bible is true, right? It's like God's way is the best. But isn't it weird? The world tries to tell us, no, there's a better way, right? No. I love what, what Pastor Chuck, you say, nothing new is true and nothing true is new. So when you're hearing it in college, oh, there's a new, better parenting way. No, no, there isn't. Moms and dads, best thing. Every civilization has been built upon the institution of marriage. It is a foundation of the happiness and success of individuals and the welfare of sec- and security of children and the soundness of society. All are largely dependent upon the stability of marriage according to the divine pattern. According to the Family Research Council, I don't know if you ever heard of that, Tony Perkins, you've, uh, you know what I'm talking about, Jeff. Family Research Council, Tony Perkins Marriage and Religi- Religion Research Institute says this, and hear this, this is a federal survey. 
I didn't know this, but do you know our government, like for senators and congressmen, they have a part of government that does surveys. That, that's all they do is surveys. And they can say, we want a survey about uh, how good uh, does church help people. And here's a survey that the federal government did, not the church. The federal government says this, clearly demonstrates that uh, the intact married family that worships, hear this, weekly. And what they mean by that is that you only miss church to go on vacation. So they're saying you only miss church about maybe two to three times a year. So that means you're going to church 49 times a year. That's what it means by that. So weekly yields the most favorable social outcomes compared to the non-intact family that worships less than monthly, maybe once a month, or never at all, or just Christmas, Easter. National data illustrates the superior in benefits for their children. Here's some of the benefits. I want you to hear this. So, so, so you moms, when you think, oh, what's my job? Here's what you're doing. Here's what it is when you, uh, when you uh, are struggling in your marriage and you feel like quitting. Here's why you don't. Here it is. Average high school GPA, English and math, almost half a grade higher, uh, grade point higher than the, than the kids with broken homes. Uh, explosion, or, uh, expulsion or s- a suspension from school, nearly three times less likely when the family's intact and they're going to church regularly. Repeating a grade, nearly six times less likely. How many like that? I repeated a grade, and uh, my family was messed up. Hard drug use, nearly 2.5 times less likely. Pretty good. Amen? Amen. Drunkenness, nearly two times less likely. Homosexual activity, three times less likely. Running away from home, over two and a half times less likely. Average number of sex partners for females, over three times less likely. Now, as I read this, do you understand why the devil attacks the family? Do you see why he attacks your marriage? And I say that to not hopefully discourage you, but to encourage you to fight for your marriage. Amen? Because the devil knows that if he can mess up your marriage, he messes up your family, he messes up the society. Amen? And so we need to really pray for our marriage, and we need to pray for the church's marriages, because uh, how many know, sadly... Divorce is as high in the church as the world, if not higher, some stats say. So the bottom line is, by going to church regularly, you enrich your marriage, you enrich your family's welfare, which will help you to have a godly marriage, which in the end will bless you and your kids. Amen? Amen. How many want an amen? There you go. Give the Lord a clap. So I want to encourage you that. And I, I don't know if I told you, I can't remember it exactly, but if you go to church, like I said, almost every week, your, your chance of divorce goes down to, I think, what was it, Kevin? It was like, I think it was, he's not here, is he? It goes from 50% failure rate to only a 15% failure rate if you go to church. Can say, how, how many want that statistic? Yeah. Going from 50 to 15, that's going to church rate. And this is a, this is a secular statistic. And then uh, it, it went down, the less you went to church, the higher. And then it actually went, if you just went to church once a month, hear this, your divorce rate went up higher than the national average. It's almost like the devil goes, they go to church, so I want to really get them bad. But they're weak. Do you see that? That should scare some of you because you need to be in church. And, and that's, a, that's a secular average, so I thought that was quite interesting. Well, as I said a couple weeks ago, I want to read the whole passage, and then we'll look at it. Because a lot of times I just start teaching from little parts of it, but I want to read the whole passage. So here it is. Titus 2, starting in verse 3 through 5. Similarly, Teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Mom shouldn't be able to drink on the table. Anyway, instead, they should teach others what is good. Verse 4, the older women must train younger women. Do you hear that? The older women. Hear this. Notice I love, I'm reading from the New Living. The older women must, not should if you have nothing better to do. The older women must train younger women to love their husbands, their children, verse 5, to live wisely and be pure, to work in their homes, to do good and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. Now hear this. You know, on Mother's Day, most pastors just kind of flatter moms and say, oh, you're good, snooky pooky wooky. I'm not that kind of pastor. I'm going to love you, but I'm going to say you're a good mom, and I want you to even be a better mom. So Mother's Day, I exhort you to be 
a good, to be a better mom than you already are. So know that. And then when you go, man, you're kind of hard on us today, realize it's coming in one month for the men. Okay? So there you go. You know, it's good. So I'm an equal opportunity offender. There it is. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for this day, and we thank you for your love. Lord, I know I didn't get much sleep, and maybe people got up early for Mother's Day, but Lord, help us really to be engaged right now to really focus on you and your word and to really hear what your spirit is saying to the church, especially to moms right now, to, to older, mature women of the church, that they would really say, God, here I am. And your word says, I must train the younger woman. That they would say, here I am, Lord. Show me who you want me to disciple. Show me who you want me to come alongside. Of course, their own daughters, but also other daughters in the church, that they would say, here I am. I'm open to whoever you want me to pour into and share the wisdom that you've shared with me. I pray also, Father, for the younger women who maybe have said, oh, I know better than my mom, or I know better than these, these older ladies. Lord, humble them to where they would truly believe that, it, that the fool learns from their own mistakes. It's like the old Toby Mac song. I was singing that today or yesterday. Some people got to learn the hard way. I'm the type of guy who's got to find out for myself. Lord, help us not to be a church like that. Amen? That we could learn from other people's mistakes. That a wise man learns from other people's mistakes. And that's why, Lord, you show us through your word all the good and the bad of people. You show us the great things of David, but you also show us the weak things of David. And so, Lord, let us learn from other people's mistakes and pitfalls so that we ourselves don't have to go through it. Amen? So God, bless us. Lead us. Speak to us, Lord. Anoint my tongue. Give me clarity of mind. Speak through me, and I pray, Lord, that you would prepare every heart, every mind who's listening, whether it's here, the lobby, on the internet, or on the radio, that, Lord, every heart would hear what you're saying through your word and through me, Lord. Anoint my tongue. Everything that I say, anything that's not of you, take it away. But everything that is of you, Lord, speak it through me clearly and give me insights far beyond what you've shown me already. I open myself up to the leading of your precious Holy Spirit. We thank you and ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Verse 3. Similarly, that word's hard for me, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. What does it mean to be a woman that honors God, or as the King James says, or to be reverent towards God? Well, to honor God means to live a life that's what? Honorable. Amen? Isn't that funny that a lot of times we want honor? We want people to speak well of us, but the key is that to get honor, sometimes we need to what? Be, be what? Honorable, right? It's so weird how we want to live a life of dishonor sometimes, but we want to be honored. But how many know God says for us, we need to be, especially moms, need to be, and women need to be women of honor. So what does that mean? When I think of honor, I think of this scripture, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, where Paul said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. How many know that should be up for all of us? Yes. Is that, you know, I, I, you know how many were raised in the old, with the old saying that, you know, do as I say, not as I do? How many were raised with that? Two of you, liars. Okay, I was raised like that. How many good Catholics out there? Who was a Catholic out there? If you're a Catholic, I heard that all the time. Do as I say, not as I do. And how many know that made me very angry towards God? Can anyone say that? Makes you, because you're angry, you're saying hypocrisy, it's lies that you're asking me as a kid to do more than you do. And it made me, at least me, I guess I'm the only sinner here, but it made me hate God. It made me hate Christianity. It made me hate the church. And God had to do an amazing work to get me back in. I remember the first time I started to realize that Jesus was the way, the truth, life. I almost went, you mean to tell me the way I was raised was really right? I mean, it was Catholic, but I said, you mean, Jesus, you're really the answer? I thought it was some, how many hippies like me remember? I thought it was some like, you know, snatch the pebble out of my hand, right? It was some Kung Fu thing. It was some Eastern thing was going to be the truth. And then I realized Jesus, who I had, almost, you know, who I've been told about all my life, didn't really understand the gospel, but been told. I, how many? How many remember that? I went. Jesus is the answer. You guys are just are not going to connect with me today, are you? I mean, I'm just like hello. I just talked to myself. Anyway, so no kidding. <laughs> so anyway, but but the old saying that I think the Bible is saying is an attitude is easier caught than taught. Amen. That what we really learn from people is watching people. 
How many are like me that I love to be people watchers? I watch people. I love to watch. I love to watch pastors, right? I love, and I know you guys watch me sometimes too, hmm, right? I love to see how pastors are in the pulpit, and I like to see how they are at home or driving or stuff. And, you know, and some of you, if you watch me drive, you've been very disappointed. But, you know, but uh, we like to see it. And, and I humbly say, sometimes the life I live in this pulpit is not the life I live at home. But how many know I can humbly say, I want there to be just one life, not two lives? Can anyone humbly say that? You know, I love what Tony Campolo said. If, I, if you knew the sin in my life, you wouldn't listen to me. But if I knew the sin in your life, I wouldn't talk to you. So there it is. So just realize. But hopefully we're all being honest to say there's areas in our life that we need to get in line more with God, right? But, and there's some things that our kids, you know, it's like, you know, you could, you could say, you could put on a good show here at, at the church. But I know all you have to do is ask a parent, ask a wife, ask a husband, and they can go, ooh, you know what I mean? I'll tell you this. Can I say this? I don't know. This is free. Maybe I'll get in trouble here. But I've done a lot of funerals. And it's really wild to me. It's kind of sad to me. But you'll hear a lot of wives, especially, will say in one breath how their husband wasn't that godly. But then the next breath, they'll say how much they loved them. How many know, I hope that you and I would like to become more like Christ to where when we die, our parent, our, our, our spouse where our kids don't have to lie at our funeral. Because I'm just going to tell you, I won't lie at your funeral. You know what I mean? Because when, when someone's life isn't that good, I just preach the gospel. I don't really talk a lot. Hey, you know, Ted, boy, he could drink someone right under the table. He was awesome. I, I don't say that. I just say, we pray Ted's with God, but uh, boom, I go right into the gospel. But I want to tell you, I pray that we all want to live a life to where our kids can honestly say, I really miss my mom. I miss my dad. My life is not going to be as full without them. Amen? Can I hear an amen on that? And, and hear this, like that song, it's never too late. If you say, oh, I've failed. You don't know what I've done, Craig. Yes, I do. Because I've done it. Been there, done that. I've done enough stuff to beat most of you in this room. But hear this, you can always start today. You can always be a better mom today, a better dad today, a better son or daughter today. You can always yield your life to Jesus. And that's all you ask, is that you keep falling forward. And that's all we ask. I don't ask for you to be perfect. I ask for you every day to be more like Jesus. You know what I pray every day? Bring people to this church who want to be disciples. How many know most people just want to be saved? Just save me and don't change my life. Just save me. But we want people that want to be saved. Well, Jesus wants people that want to be saved and follow his word. How many know that? Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. And what was the last thing? And teach them. To obey all that I've given. Not just save them. But the key is save and then what? Obey. And that's where we, how many know that's the rest of our lives? That's not, salvation's easy, but the discipleship is the hard part, right? Surrendering your life to God. Taking up your cross. You know what that means? It doesn't mean you're literally going to be put on a cross, but it means dying to those selfish desires. Dying to those fleshly things that you say, oh, I can never let go of that. How many know we're just saying, Jesus, you're enough? Jesus' power is enough. And hear this, I was saying to someone this week, how many know Satan, the only power really Satan has in your life is when you believe his lies. Because it says in Revelation 12 that they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as what? To shrink from death. Meaning they say, you know, think about, I think how scary that is for the devil when you go, Hey, Satan, to live is Christ, to die is again. You want to kill me? It's a good day. Because then he has nothing on you if you're not afraid to die. Right? And none of us should be afraid to die if we're living for God. Right? doesn't mean you drive crazy, but I'm just saying, you say, hey, I pray for your protection, but if it's my day, I'm excited. Amen? Amen. Excited to go. And Satan then has nothing on us. That was a lot of free stuff right there. All right. Was I? Oh, I want to show you real quick a, a little clip. How many know Pastor Chuck Smith? He's the guy who founded Calvary Chapels. I want to show you a little clip about Pastor Chuck. Can you get the light, somebody? Uh, show you a little clip about Pastor Chuck Smith talking about his mama. I think that's pretty cool. Watch this for a te- second. There's Pastor Chuck. He's now with the Lord, but I thought it's pretty cool. My mother's life was not so open as my dad's as far as witness but her life was the witness she was the silent witness and uh, i can't remember 
going to bed at night at home. But what the last thing at night I heard was my mother praying. Uh, prayed every night. I can't remember waking up in the morning at home, but what the first sounds I heard were my mother praying uh, in the morning. I mean, she just, a life of prayer, life of commitment, and uh, just so consistent in her walk with the Lord. I heard Pastor Chuck Smith speak about that in real life. And he was crying his eyes out talking about his mama. Can I ask this? I'm not a mom. I might, you know, I mean, I don't know. But uh, people always say to me, happy mothers. I'm like, what does that mean? But anyway, so I'm not a mom. But hear this. How many moms would like your son to say that about you or your, mo- your, your daughter? Amen? Three of you. Okay, good. But uh, most of you, right? You want your kid to go, man, my mom was a good example. My mom spurred me on to the Lord. My mom changed my life. Jesus flowed through my mom. And I don't know about you, but when you see a guy who's 80 years old talking about his mama with tears streaming down his face, that touches me. I didn't have a mom. My mom died when I was six. I don't know about you, but I say, moms, keep up the good work, but keep on keeping on. Don't quit. You know, keep allowing God to make you better and better and better because I'll tell you, your kids need that. Amen? They need the love. And as Kevin was trying to say, I think, the, one of the names of God is El Shaddai, right? Do you know what El Shaddai means? One time I was praying, and as a baby Christian, the Lord said, you miss not having a dad. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. And I never knew my dad until later in my life. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And then God said, I'm a father to the father. So, well, we all know that verse. But then God said, you miss not having your mom. And I go, oh, okay, God, okay, God. And I'm crying each time, okay. But I'm like, Lord, I'm good, I'm good. And the Lord said, I'm your mother. And I remember hearing that and thinking, I got some weird theology there. That's weird. And then I remember all of a sudden I'm in Bible college and the guy, my teacher said El Shaddai means, one of the meanings of El Shaddai means many-breasted one. It means like the love, the tender love of a mother. And I love the scripture when I think of that where it says, will the mother leave the child at her breast? And what's the answer? Some moms have. Sadly, most moms don't, but some moms have. So he says, so God knows that. He says, even if your mother leaves you or forsakes you, I will never leave you. Nor forsake you. How many love that? So Jesus' love is even greater than that of mom. Even though moms, you guys are amazing. Especially way better than us dads in love, right? I tell you, when my kids get hurt, who do they go to? Mom. They don't go to me. Because I'm going to say, you know why you fell? Because you ran in the house with wet feet, you know, I mean, you know, and the mom's like, oh, pookie schnooky, that bad floor, mm, you know, right, I mean, that's a mom, right, but I mean, no, Jesus is like that sometimes, right, he just, you know, when the woman's caught in adultery, he didn't go, hey, you know why this is happening, he went, hey, you know, go and sin no more, he, he picked her up, he says, I don't condemn you, where are your accusers, go and sin no more, and there you see the tender mercy and love of a mother, and that's, what Jesus is. Middle of verse 3. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Like I said, mom shouldn't be able to drink you under the table. She shouldn't be pounding a 40 right before dinner. She shouldn't be doing that, right? That looks a little weird to me. I, I remember I dated a girl before I was a Christian, and I remember this mom I went to the bar, and the mom, I, I ordered a Long Island iced tea. And she goes, are you going to ever drink a man's drink? Mom, you know, I mean, it's just weird, you know, and she goes, here's a shot of whiskey. I was like, wow, you know, how many know that's not the picture of a mom you want? And I was this pagan, and it scared me, okay? So you don't want to be that mom. But it says they must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. What does it mean to slander here? I thought this was very interesting. It's from the Greek word diablos. Does anyone speak Spanish here? What does diablos mean? The devil, right? Don't be the devil. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Women, don't be the devil, right? Don't be the devil, which is one of the names of the devil. And what does it mean to be the, like the devil? What does it mean to slander? Here it is. He, what does the devil do? He accuses. He's the accuser, accuser of the brother, and he slanders the brother in night and day before God. One of the Greek definitions of this word means when you falsely accuse your brother or sister, Hear this, I like this. It says you're taking part with the devil and his work. How many of you can say humbly, I don't want to take part with the devil and his work? Now, now let me explain what that means, because I think we get, we, how many know we go out of balance? We either go too far, being critical on people, or we go the other way, and we never are ever judging, never judge in a biblical way. Let me explain what I mean. 
You don't, here's what it's talking about here. Here's the slander he's talking about here. If you see someone sitting in the church, you see someone sleeping with their boyfriend, you go, oh, she'll never change. How many know that's the devil's talk? Or that person's going to go to hell. They're, they're, they're going to go to hell. I know they're going to hell. How many know that's the devil's talk? You see what I mean? It's condemning. It's, it's, it's saying they'll never change. It's, it's, it's condemning. It's accusatory. It says that person is a sinner and they're going to always stay a sinner. Does that make sense to you? But here's the other problem. Because sometimes we try so hard to not do that that we go the other way to where we never judge. And I hope if you've been here a while, you know we are to judge biblically. Read 1 Corinthians 5 on your own. But hear this. How many know the number one verse memorized by the world is now what? It used to be John 3, 16. Does anyone know what it is? I've told you before. It's, it's Matthew 7, 1. Judge not, lest you be judged. So what do we say with that? Never judge anything. How many know it's good to read the whole counsel of God? Because if you take one little scripture, you can really get some bad theology. You need the whole counsel to balance things. Because in that same chapter, in verse 16 of Matthew 7, 20, 7, 1 is judge not lest you be judged. But Matthew 7, 16 says what? You will know them by their fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. By this you will know them. Well, I want to ask you, how do you go and pick lemons on a lemon tree? You have to judge. That's a lemon tree. How do you get apples? Do you just go out there? I don't want to judge. I'm just going to grab. You, you judge, right? You go, that's a lemon tree. That's an apple tree. That's a thorn bush. And so we have to realize is that if someone's walking in blatant sin, we can judge that. We can say, according to 1 Corinthians 5, if we see someone walking in willful sin, they're sleeping with their boyfriend, they're committing adultery on their wife, we can say, you are walking in willful sin. We try to encourage them to repent, but if they don't, we are to judge that, Paul says, and we are to not fellowship with them, what? Until they repent. Do you hear that? And he says, we are to judge those inside the church but we are not to judge those outside the church. And hear this. Here's what that means. Because some people say, well, my son or daughter, they're not walking close to the Lord anymore. Here's what I always say to them. Here's how I found out if they have, can be under the judgment of God and His Word. Do you believe you're going to die, you go to heaven? If they say that, then they're under the Word of God. Does that make sense? You hear, tracking with me? And then you say, if you're going to walk in this blatant sin, I can't fellowship with you. I love you. I'm praying for you, but I can't. So do you hear that? We go either too slanderous to shred and say they'll never change, or we go the other way of so loosey-goosey that we allow sin in the church. And why is it important not to allow that in the church? Because Paul says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Saying a little bit of yeast allowed, a little bit of yeast allowed in the church spreads like wildfire. How many know it's easy to sin? Just like it's easy to plant weeds in your garden. Right? Do you notice that? I always love it. I try to grow grass, dies. But weeds are doing great in my yard. Never have to water them. Never have to worry about them. They're, oh, my weeds are doing bad. No, they're always doing good. And we have to know that. It's easy to do bad. And so we need to have that a commitment. And we need to do this. L let me give you an example. I'll, I'll give you a little side note here. How important this is. How many of you all heard about the gay gene? Everyone's trying to find the gay gene, right? Did you have a gay gene? You ever heard of that? Right? Can you say that? See you? Yeah, the gay gene. How many know there's no, they haven't found the gay gene. There is no gay gene. But here's what it is. There's a spirit. And I had a friend, and some of you know my friend, but he allowed his sister-in-law, who was walking in blatant homosexuality as a Christian, and was living with her girlfriend, and he allowed her to fellowship with them and their family. And yet the Bible says, read it on your own, 1 Corinthians 5, that you're not supposed to fellowship with someone who's in willful sin like that. Well, guess what? I told him, hey, you know, what are you doing? I almost said his name. What are you doing? And he says, well, Dr. James Dobson, who I just quoted, said that you got to love him back in the kingdom. You know the Bible says, let God be true and every man be a liar? When Dr. James Dobson, who I love most of the time, but I have to respectfully disagree with that statement, how many know that is not what the Bible says? You're to love them. 
You're to pray for them, but you are not to fellowship with them. Because if you do, you're welcoming that spirit into your house. You're welcoming that spirit. And guess what? My friend who did that, guess what delight he got a couple years later? His son told him, I'm a homosexual Christian. That's how it spreads. Do you get my point? So when God tells you not to do something, how many? he doesn't just say, let's see if I can make it hard on your family. He doesn't just say no to something just to be hard. He says no to what? Protect you. He says no to protect you. But how many know? Most of us are so liberal, we would never do that. Some of you right now are hearing me going, ah, pfft, ah. But guess what? Your fight, one person said, I just don't like your stance on homosexuality. And I said, well, guess what? Your fight is with God. You guys are mellow today, man. I'm just like, I don't know if it's because I'm so tired or you're mellow. I don't know what it is, but it's well. But anyways, here he says, he says, instead, these older women should teach others what is good. Godly women or good moms don't do the work of the devil. Amen? You're not, you're not following Diablos. But instead, you do the work of God by teaching the good things found in the Word of God. And here's the following good things. Here it is, verse 4. The older women excuse me, must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. The word train here means restore one to their senses. How many know when you're born, you're born in the flesh, yes. right? I always love when people say, aren't children are just so innocent. They're just so precious. That's because they can't talk, okay? <laughs> but, you know what I mean? But how I many know children aren't so innocent right away, right? You don't teach your child just like weeds. Okay, now work with me. Mine! Say mine. You, know, you don't have to work with them. They got that down, amen? My toy. You know, I never forget. I didn't have to teach Morgan. Isn't Morgan precious? He's precious. But when Mariah came into the world, you should have seen when here's Mariah sitting at on, on mommy's chest and, you know, just sitting next to her breast and just sitting there. And, and, and here's Morgan's love for her. He looked at mommy and goes, you unfaithful woman. No, he didn't say it. But that was his look. He looked at her like, oh, I thought I was it. Right? And here's what he does. So she breaks. She goes, look at your little sister. And, and so Morgan comes in. And you know what Morgan does? He kind of goes, Ee! and so Mariah's like, ah! Like this. I mean, that's the natural love, right? Okay? So we had to teach him. You don't push your baby, your sister's head off of mommy, right? You got to love her, right? He's like, okay. And then everyone's like, mm, right? Right? Mariah knows. So that means Mariah's like, ah. Half the time you see her pictures, ah, because Morgan's always, you know, giving her talk to the hand, you know? But anyways, so where was I on that? But anyways, so we need restore. The train there means to restore to their senses. So it means bring us back to the Spirit or bring us, lead us in the things of the Spirit. Because remember, Jesus said, why are you so dull? Do you, realize, do you ever realize that? Sometimes we're dull to the things of God, right? You know, we hear the word, we go, <laughs> right? We, that's why I always pray, Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit. Because what does the Holy Spirit do? He leads us into all truth. Without the Holy Spirit, we're blind to the truth, right? The natural man, it says in, I think, 1 Corinthians 2, the natural man does not discern the things of the Spirit. We don't have a clue. We read the Bible, we go, I don't know. Remember what Jesus said? Thank you, Father, that you've hidden these things to wise and learned men, but revealed it to babes. So guess what? When you read the Word, don't go, yes, I understand this. Go, help me, Lord, because we need to come to our senses. It also means to hold one accountable to their duty. So you older, more mature women are to hold the younger woman accountable to their duty as a wife, to their duty as a young lady. Amen? It also means to admonish, to exhort earnestly. How many know that we need that more in the church? Loving, admonishment, and ex exhortation. You know, everyone loves the prophet who comforts and encourages but very few people love the prophet who exhorts. Right? I love, I told you this a million times, people say, Craig, just preach the word. Well, they really say just teach the word. You know what that means? Just teach the word, but don't tell us to live the word. Don't try to say places where we don't live the word. But how many know sometimes we need a little, right? Come on, right? Didn't your little baby, when he's walking, didn't he need to be taught? Come on, come on, come on, come on. If you just said, oh, he'll just learn whenever, he would probably say, no, I like to be in my little stroller thing. It's really cool, right? Do you remember that? I remember Morgan, he said, I like my little stroller. You remember the little thing where you kind of, your legs are dangling, so you kind of have the feeling of walking, but not really? <laughs> but one day we said no, and we had to exhort him, come on, walk, 
right? And then he walked and pushed his sister. It was great. But anyway, um, <laughs> where is it? But he says, so he says, teach them to love their husbands. I think it's wild to me that Paul here says older women are to teach younger women to love their husbands. Isn't that wild? Think about this. In Ephesians 5.22 and verse 33, Paul doesn't tell women to love their husbands. He just assumes in Ephesians 5 that women do love their husbands. But he, but he tells them, wives, you need to, he says this, he says, women, you need to what? Um, submit, verse 22, to your husband. And that's easy to do, isn't it? No problem there. You guys love it when we talk about that. Submission. And then he says what in verse 33? Respect your husband as unto the Lord. So hear this. I thought this was interesting. Maybe I just thought it was interesting. You guys maybe won't see it. But So why the difference here? Well, most of you have heard the book. How many have heard the book uh, Five Love Languages? How many have heard that? Right? By Gary Chapman. And he says, and I had to write this down because I only remember three out of the five, but it says, this is why I'm probably not a good best husband always, but here it is. Words of affirmation, acts of service, gift giving, quality time, physical touch. Okay, whatever your spouse is doing to you a lot is what they usually have their gift. If your spouse is always, you know, one thing I'll say, Kevin's not my spouse, but Kevin is always given really good birthday gifts. So he's a gift, he is a gift giver. So guess what Kevin likes? Gift. You know, when he was little, he used to go, it's my birthday in three months. And I'd say, I don't care. You know what I mean? But I didn't say that. But it was like, you know, my birthday, right? Because why? He's a gift giver, right? So hear that. I'm saying it's a little trick for you guys, especially you clueless guys, right? It, it, whatever your spouse does a lot, that's usually what they like. But here's why I'm saying that to say, how many know, in Ephesians 5, he doesn't say wives love your husbands because that's kind of natural for you. Love is natural for you women. You are naturally more loving than men. Agreed? Amen? Can I hear an amen? But he says, wives, because this is natural for you, submit. Because that's, that's a little harder. Respect. Okay, now you're really getting personal. Okay. But then what does he say to men, right? Men know to respect each other, right? Like, like here's, here's the difference. I'll say this to you. This is free. I've got to go long today, so just buckle in. All right, here it is. <laughs> the pot roast will wait. But here it is. Um, you, you, you don't, you uh, think about this. If I say to a man, hey, what's your, you know, say, Glenn, what's your opinion on this? And Glenn gives me an opinion, and it's not, it's the dumbest opinion ever. I don't go, Glenn, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. I know not to say that because that would be what? Disrespectful. But women can do that all the time. <laughs> what do you think of this dress? That is ugly. Oh, really? You think so, Sally? Okay, yeah, I knew. I kind of, you know, right? Guys, we don't do that, right? We say, yeah, the look, suit looks great on you. <gasps> right? Because we know respect. But you women can be, oh, right it's a totally different thing does that make sense to you but hear this so guys we our natural thing is not to love so god tells us in this chapter husbands love your wives as christ loved the church and gave himself up for her do you realize that so he's telling us our weaknesses your weakness is to submit and respect our weakness is to love like christ does that make sense there you go so hear this so, well, why then would you show love? So, well, what's the way you show love to your husband? Now, hear this. You wives would say, here's how I show love because this is what you like. Write little notes. I give him flowers. No. You give me flowers. You give me a note. You know, I'm looking for money. No, no money. Nick. You know, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, no, no, I'm being a little hard, but you know, I, they don't thrill me. You know what I mean? My wife's got every letter I've ever written, which is three, but I mean, she's got everyone. I mean, and she's, oh, right. I'm just like, you know, I mean, I, yeah. any other sinner men like me? I mean, it doesn't snap my shorts. Okay. So here's what you do with a man. Here's how you show your man love. You respect them. You tell them. You want to write a note? Say, honey, you are the most honorable man I know besides Jesus. 
I trust your leadership. With your leadership, I feel so secure. I know you might feel like well, you're lying, but speak things that are not, okay? <laughs> Call things that are not like God that are not, that will be. But you say it, and guess what? That man will be, really? <laughs> Thank you, right? But if you write him a card, I love you, pookie, spookie, XOXO, hug, hug, little kiss, big kiss, whatever. But you tell him, I'm proud of you. Tell him, I really hear God's leadership through I feel secure with you. It's, I never forget. It's like the first time I told Cannon, Teresa and I said, man, you can see your muscles. And I remember Cannon's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want, just try it. Try it with your husband. Try that. Tell, tell him, write that note. And you watch your husband. <laughs> right? Watch it. It's just like this. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, grab your husband's arm and watch it flex. No husband's going to go, yeah, look at this. It's so loose. Look at this. Look at how he's going to be like, yeah, yeah. I've been working out a little bit. Mm -hmm. This is how I walk. This is normal. Right? And, you, know, I mean, you know, they're going to do that, right? So anyway, you get the point? Different. And so wives, don't give what you like. Give what the man needs and needs to respect. And husbands, don't give. Don't buy your wife for Mother's Day a toolbox. No. <laughs> get her the card. Tell her how you feel, right? Express your feelings because that's not natural for you, but they know that. That's why it means so much to them. Yeah. Amen? So that's it. And it's not always easy for you women to show respect and, and, uh, and respect to your goofy husbands, is it? It's not. I know it. My wife has to do it all the time. So the older, more mature woman is to help the younger married women or younger women to, mar to be married to respect their husbands, especially when they do boneheaded things. By showing them the respect, the older women, show, showing them, you older women are supposed to show the younger women the ropes. How to show respect, how to trust. Now hear this, guys, I want to say another thing. I've heard so many women, they don't respect the other extreme, no respect to their husband. But then some women do the opposite, where they respect everything of their husband. I'll give you a quick story example. We had a lady hear her. She said, Craig, my husband is looking at pornography right in front of me. I mean, not even caring, just shh, right. Hey, look at this. You know, didn't care. She was heartbroken. So she says, Pastor Craig, will you confront him with me? I said, yeah, sure. So I confront him. He doesn't repent. He basically says, yeah, well, you know, it's your opinion. I don't think it hurts anyone. Da, da, da. All of a sudden, the next week, he had a revelation from God that he was supposed to leave this church because he wasn't getting fed. How I many know oh, that's a time when I think a wife can respectfully say, you know, I'm supposed to submit to you 99.9% .9 of the time, but I think this thing is not a good time to respect you, to submit to you, because you are wrong. You're in sin, and I'm not leaving this church because I know why you're wanting to leave. You're wanting to leave because you don't want to be accountable. Do you see what I'm saying? So don't think submission means if, you're, if your husband says, honey, we need a little extra money, I need you to be a prostitute for the Christmas season. No. You say no. I love you, but I can't honor that because why? I love God more, and you're telling me to do something that goes against God. Amen? But if your husband says, you know, if, if there's something like, you know, I want to buy a minivan or I want to buy a Tahoe, and your husband says, uh, I want the Tahoe, there's something you can submit to. Right? No. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. No. I want the minivan. It's much more practical. Right? Right? But that's something you can submit to, right? Because it's not the end of the world. There's no, there's no scripture on that. Thou shalt buy a minivan. No. Okay? So anyway, end of verse 4. Younger women, so we're to love our husbands, you're to love your husbands, and then it says, and love their children. This is kind of wild to me. A lot of times you don't have to tell a new young mother to love and dote on her baby girl or boy. Amen? They're like, look at my little boogies, boogies. <laughs> right? You don't have to tell them to do that. More, <laughs> you got to do that. No, they love them. But hear this, sometimes you have to tell young moms to love their little pookie schmookie enough to discipline them. Amen? How many of you ever heard this? Have you ever watched Tim Hawkins? I love Tim Hawkins. I try to imitate Tim Hawkins all the time, but I can't do it. But anyway, don't you love Tim? He goes, yeah, when, you know, the kid's in the nursery. He says, yeah, um, the reason why Timmy stabbed uh, Sally with the scissors, he's got allergies. Right? I mean, you know, we tend to make excuses, don't we? Oh, he, you know, he, 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 he got in a fight with his dad today. That's why he pushed his sister down. You know, we make excuses. 
But how many know sometimes we need to discipline little Tommy or little Sally, and we need to say, hey, no, you know? I love what Tim Hawkins says, you know, the nanny, remember the nanny says, no, Thomas, no, don't hit your mother over the head with a pot, right? No, you know, sometimes you got to say no, like the nanny, right? No, it says this in Proverbs 13, 24, it says, those who spare the rod of discipline, now hear this, it didn't say those who beat their children, now hear that, people always want to say that, especially at the university, you see, the Bible says to beat your children, no, It doesn't. It says those who spare the rod of discipline. Here's what that rod of discipline, it's a spanking. Amen? And how we know secular counselors, a lot of them say, have said, you shouldn't spank. Spank's unhealthy, it damages the child, da 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 da, all this stuff. But all of them, most of them who said that didn't have children. (laughs) Seriously. And then when they had children, then they went back to them and said, do you still feel it? And they go, and most of them said, you know, there's this time where you need to spank your child because a timeout just doesn't do it. They'll just, they'll just be in the timeout just going, yeah, mom, you know, and just kind of mocking you as they do it. But there's something about that little, you know, not done in anger or you beat them, but just that, whoosh, that oh, it just seems like it gets right to the brain, right? That, ah, oh, they get it, <laughs> right? It's like there's something about it. And not done in anger. I'll never forget, I, one time I was spanking Candon, and I always, I would spank them, and Candon was kind of like one of those, <laughs> He'd fight it. <laughs> and then I would say, I'm gonna, I gotta get past the, <laughs> you know. And so I spanked him hard, and all of a sudden I go, Candy, do you, do you know why I spanked you? And he was really young. He's probably three or four, maybe five, I don't know. He says, You know, I, yeah. he goes, Yeah, <laughs> Daddy, I, I, oh, I know. And I said, Why? Because I know you love me so much that you want me to know that it's not good to do bad things. Isn't that why we do it? Isn't that why? Think about this. We're trying to teach our kids. I'm going to say this later. But when our kids is reaching up to the stove, rather than getting third degree burns, I mean, they learn that way. But we're saying no, so they learn not to have to get burnt. But the whole point is we're trying to teach them there's consequences to sin. We're trying to teach them that he who sows the flesh reaps what? Death and corruption. But he who sows the spirit does things right. He gets blessed, has life, and life more abundantly. That's what we're trying to teach our kids. But you see, a lot of people don't want to do that. I'll never forget. I was not taught that way, so I had to learn. I almost was put in prison for nine years because nobody disciplined me. My good friend, I would try to get him to sin, and he would a lot of times go, nope. I go, why not? Well, you're a sissy. What's wrong with you? And he go, why? Because his parents told him there's consequences to sin, and he didn't want to do it. How many know we need to be like that? We need to teach our kids, you walk in the ways of God, you're blessed. You fight the ways of God, you will have a hard life, as we'll see in a moment. So it says, those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Isn't that funny? We think we love our children by spoiling them, by not being disciplining them. But it says you hate them. You hate them. And it says, those who love their children care enough to discipline them promptly. And don't you love this? Could I just say this? If you've had kids, don't you love kids when they're in the store, they can go, all right? Because they're like, mom, what are you going to do? Beat me in the store? We would say to our kids, no, there's a bathroom somewhere here, isn't there? And we would take our kids, you know, if they did that, you know, like kind of like, what are you going to do? You know, we'd say, we'd go, oh, no, you didn't. Right? We would take them in there and boom, we get that handicap stall, and I mean, you would hear things fly, and, and all of a sudden they learn, there is no safe place from discipline, right? There's a van, or there's, there's a, and, and we need to teach that to our children. Haven't you seen kids like that in the store? I just want to go, I'll take it, look the other way, mom. You know, I want to go, right? How many of you felt that? No one's going to, I've never felt that. Yes, you have. You ever in a plane where the kid's hitting your seat? <laughs> You're like, <laughs> okay, hold on, move that way. <laughs> you know, I mean, I want to grab them. And guess what? It's not the kid's fault. It's the parent's fault. You should be spanking the parent. Get over here. <laughs> right? I love what one Christian psychologist said. If you don't love your kids enough to discipline them at times with a spanking, he says then a police officer might have to discipline them with a nightstick. How many would rather have it that you spank your kid than a police officer spank them with a nightstick or put them in jail? I got spanked by a couple nightsticks, and I got put in jail looking at nine years of prison. And if it wasn't for the mercy of God, you're, I would have had a jail ministry for a long time. Okay? Thank God for, you know, 
<laughs> I better not say what I'm saying. But I got off in a technicality by the mercy of God. Hear this. Proverbs 13, 15 says this. The way of the transgressor is hard. Isn't it amazing how many Christians say, Oh, it's so hard to follow the Lord. It's just so hard to be godly. No, not true. I mean, it is. There's some work, but it's a lot harder to be a sinner. How many can say amen to that? It's a lot harder to be a sinner. I can tell you, I remember I've told you stories. Uh, you know, I can tell you stories, but I'm safe for the sake of time. But it's a lot harder. The way of the transgressor or sinner is hard. And we need to teach our kids that, that truth. Uh, verse 5, finishing up. To live wisely, so the you know, older women are teach younger women, to live wisely, to be pure, to work in their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands, then they will not bring shame on the word of God. What does it mean to bring shame on the word of God? Or as the New King James says, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Shame or blaspheme means here, hear this, it means to speak evil of, or to speak disapprovingly of, or to revile, or to criticize harshly. How many can humbly say that a lot of people criticize harshly the church of Jesus Christ? A lot of people criticize the word of God. A lot of people criticize Christians. And let's just be real, rightfully so a lot of times. Because the church has allowed a lot of sin, allowed a lot of things that shouldn't be in it, and so the world kind of goes. Pfft. Now, be real, it doesn't matter what we do, so there's going to be people that always poo-poo the church. But how many know, let's not give them much to talk about. Let's live lives that we can say like Paul, follow my example as I follow humbly the example of Christ. Amen? I think of the verse in 2 Samuel 2, 4, 12, 14, where how many remember when David sinned with Bathsheba? Remember what Nathan the prophet said? Because of you, the enemies of God blaspheme. How many know I don't want to be a pastor? Whenever I'm tempted to sin, I think, or whenever I'm tempted to quit, I think about how many people and how many enemies of God and how many people would be so happy if I quit and would say, see, I knew it wasn't real. And I do it first for the love of God, but I also do it for the love of a witness that I realize as a pastor, remember it says, let there be few teachers so that we can incur stricter judgment. I'm at a higher judgment than a lot of you. Now don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean you aren't to live for God, but I need to realize there's a lot of more people looking at my life than some of your lives, and they're looking at me. Now they're looking at you too, but I need to remember if I fail, how many know when pastor fails, a lot of people freak out. You know, a lot of people freak out and say, see, 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 and I don't, there's enough pastors already taking that spot. I don't want that spot. I want to be used by God to bring honor back to the church, back to the ministry, back to the Word of God. Amen. The Word of God is honorable, but I want to bring honor where we're living the Word. Amen. Amen. If you were asked me, Pastor Craig, what is the most frustrating and sad thing that you see in the church? I would say hands down that in these last days, it sometimes seems to hear this, that Jesus doesn't work. That he doesn't really change lives anymore today. How, how many can humbly say sometimes you feel that? I, I'll tell you this, if I can say this. How many remember the Jesus movement? I mean, radical changes. I mean, how many, half of the Calvary pastors got saved on LSD? I'm one of them. I got saved on drugs. God spoke to me on drugs. How sovereign is that? I mean, and then once I got saved, instantly delivered from drugs. You don't see that very much in here. Yeah, you can give the Lord a clap. You don't see that anymore. Do you? Not too much. Maybe in China, maybe in Iran, but not too much in America. And why is that? Is it because Jesus is not the same yesterday, today, and forevermore? No. Here's what I think it is, is because very few of us are truly yielding, are sick of ourselves, and when we say, okay, God, I give you my whole life. How many know the woman caught in adultery who was ready to be stoned to death? When Jesus said, I don't condemn you, now go and sin no more. How many know she didn't go, oh, I got off. Okay, I'm going to go right back. She was like, oh, thank you, God. How many know Jesus said, he has been forgiven much, loves much. Oh, but here's what, this is why I fight cheap grace. This is why I fight hardcore Calvinism. Because the hardcore Calvinist says, once you're saved, you can do whatever you want. 
But how many remember, do you remember in our day, do you remember, remember in the early days? Remember in the early Jesus movement? There, was, they, there, there wasn't just the love of God, there was also the fear of God. Amen. But we don't get the fear of God anymore. We just go, Jesus loves you, this I know, do whatever you want to do. No, it's like, no. Didn't he say, you'll know them by their fruit. And how do I know? What did I know? I knew I was headed for hell. I knew I almost blew my head off, and Jesus saved me. So I owe him everything. So it's not, when I come to my senses, I realize it's not Jesus' fault. It's not because Jesus is powerless to save. It's because we are not preaching the whole counsel of God. Because we're not telling people that, you know, I just read this verse. I think it's 1 Peter 4.18. No one preaches this verse. Do you hear this verse? Let me tell you this verse. You're going to love this. If it's hard for the righteous to be saved. Did you hear what I just said? If it's hard for the righteous to be saved. How much more the ungodly? (laughs) If it's hard for the righteous to be saved, how much more the ungodly? Do you hear that? That don't preach very often in churches today. That's legalism. Oh, but that's your Bible. That's Peter. Right? That's the Old Testament and New Testament. It's in the Proverbs and it's in 1 Peter 4. So guess what, guys? We need to, as I said, We need a good brainwashing, right? Renewing of our minds to get back to the whole counsel of God of that, yes, God is love. Yes, God is gracious, but he's also a just God who will say to some people, depart from me, I never knew you, that think they're saved. And I've never met anyone say, that's me. So I know they're going to go there and go, hey, Jesus, what's up? And they're going to be, and they're going to be shocked out of their mind. But guess what, guys? Look at me as I'm being a mean pastor right now. I don't want anyone here to hear that. I want all of you to have the holy fear of God. Not fear of like, (laughs) God hates me. No, but God is just and he's serious and you need to take him serious. And guess what? If we look at that cross and said he gave his all for me, now what do we, what's our right response? Now I give my all in love to you. A lot of us want the blessings of God, but a lot of us don't want to do it his way. If you want the blessings of God, you've got to do it his way. Amen. It's like he believes he's God or something. <laughs> Luke 6, 46. If you can turn quickly, turn there. If not, I'll just read it for you. Hear this, guys. I want to explain this to you, too. We don't put a lot of the scripture up on the thing. We put the ones, the little side scriptures, but the main scripture we don't because we want you to have your Bible. We don't want you to just look at the screen. We want you to actually crack that, you know, those little, the little gold thing, the gold paint on your Bible. We want you to get all those moved out. Right? So we want you to bring a Bible. So bring a Bible, right? So that way you, uh, that's why we don't show all the scripture because we want you, we want to hear those pages turn or at least see your tablet swiping, right? Do that. But here's what it says, Luke 6, 46. Jesus is talking. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Hear that? Remember when Jesus in Acts where Peter, or Jesus said to Peter, kill and eat? And what is Peter's response? An oxymoron. No, Lord. Do you hear the problem there? No, Lord. If he's Lord, he can't say no because he's Lord, right? If if, If Jesus is my Lord, then what he says goes, right? Or he's not my Lord. He's my friend. He's my buddy. But if he's my Lord, what he says, I say, yes, Lord. Do you get it? And so here it is. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? Verse 47. I will show you what he is like, the person who does who does this is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them, hear that, puts them into practice. So he hears and puts it into practice. Verse 48, he is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. Who's the rock? John 1.14, Jesus is what? The word become flesh. When you obey the word, you're building your life on who? The rock of Jesus Christ. The solid rock of Christ. The same strength Christ had, you have when you live and obey his word. You're built on the rock. And hear this, I love it. It doesn't say if the floods come, when the floods come. When a flood came and the torrent struck. So how many know torrents are going to come your way sometimes? I don't care what the faith movement says. There's going to be torrents sometimes. There's going to be rain. Here he says, So when the floods came, the torrent struck the, that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. How many like that? Yeah. How many want to have to where when the storms come, your family, your marriage, 
your life stands. But what is that? That's when your life is built, amen, built on the Word. How many know what's the problem, why we're not seeing change? Because a lot of people just like to hear the Word but not do the Word. I told you about the guy who's, who was sitting there at our church. He was smoking weed every day, having a Bible study. And he said to me, Craig, when are we going to get into the deep things of the Lord? And I said, when you can stop smoking weed, I'll get into the deep things of the Lord. How many know God wants us to get the basic things down before we get in the deep? Didn't Paul say, you're drinking milk, yet you should be eating meat. But I'm not going to give you meat until you get good at milk. Right? He was faithful. Little be faithful. You can't just go and then say, let's get to the deep things. God's saying, this is the most important thing. This little thing of weed smoking is more important than getting the deep things. Hello? Verse 49. But the one, here's the opposite, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice. So here's someone who hears the words, which I'd say is pretty much the majority of the church in America who, who put, hears my words and does not put them into practice, is like a man who built his house on the sand or ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. I think that's why a lot of people scoff at the church. Because they go, you're no different than us. You get hit by a storm, you freak out just like us. You don't stand any stronger than us. How many know that we're supposed to live lives, not that, that are perfect, but we're to live lives that when people look at us, they go, wait a sec, Craig, you're not that strong. How did you stand that storm? And where I don't go, here I come to save it. No, I say, you know how I stood that storm? By the grace and strength of God. Amen. And people go, well, can, can I, how do I get this, God? That's the way our life is supposed to be. But if we're just like sinners and we're freaking out just like the world, guess what they go? Hey, you're just like me. Why would I want anything that you have? Do you see it? So what's the key? Hear this. What's the difference? One hears the word and doesn't do it. One hears the word and puts it into practice. That's the key. That's what separates. That's the only difference. One does it, one doesn't. You do it, you're on the rock. You don't, you're just like the world. You're going to be wiped out when the hardships of life come. Mom, dads, if you're, the things in your life are not going well with you and your family, your marriage, if the storms of life seem to be wiping you out, then hear this. You need to ask the Lord, Father, where am I not obeying your word? How many know that? Sometimes we just think, oh, life's just going bad with me. Life's just, you know, I'm doing good and life's going bad. I hear people all the time, man, I've been seeing the Lord and all of a sudden all this stuff happened to me. How many know this? What does the Bible say? Proverbs it's a man's own folly or foolishness that ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. So guess what? If your life's failing, it's not because of God. It's because you're not following the word of God. But here's the cool good news. Here's good news. So you guys, are, this is the best, worst mother's name I've ever had in my life. Okay, here's the good news. If you ask the Father, where am I not obeying your word? How many know, according to James 1.5, he says what? I, anyone who lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. He will give without holding back. will give liberally. He'll show you where you're wrong. But hear this, you've got to first humble yourself and say, I'm wrong. Then you've got to say, hey God, I know it's not me, it's not you, it's me. So Lord, show me what I need to do or stop doing because I know you can fix me. Amen. And do that and trust that he promises that he will show you. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. And guess what, guys? Can I just say this too? My wife and I, we kind of got in a fight this weekend. So I'm a really great dad for Mother's Day. But hear this. A lot of our fight comes from religiosity. How many know the Bible says in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 5, it says in the last days, Men will have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof that could change them. How many know we're living in days where people are very religious? Jesus, 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 but they're not letting the Holy Spirit fill them and change them. And what we realize is through our families, we've learned a lot of religious stuff. And how many know religion doesn't help you? 
religious, Jesus hated the religious leaders. He, he, he didn't, I wouldn't say hated, but he fought hard. If you looked at Jesus, he went hard against them. That's who he opposed. He didn't oppose prostitutes and homosexuals and sinners. He opposed the religious hypocrites. So I don't know about you, but I am sick of religion. And I want a true, sincere relig- uh, relationship with Christ. I want to be like David, where he says, Lord, you desire truth in the innermost parts. Do you understand that? Where it's real. Where it's not, it's, it's not so much worrying about this as it's first worrying about this. Amen? And when this is right, Jesus said, if you love, if you love me, said the Pharisee, you would, if you love my father, you would have loved me. And now we know the same is true. If you love God and you're right with God, then those who love God will love you. And that's what I trust in. Whenever I say hard things, I know some of you are going to look at me. But I know those of you who love God, even despite me, you'll still hear the truth and you'll say, Craig's hard to swallow sometimes, but I heard God. I heard you, Father. So moms, we love you. Despite my meanness, we love you. And we really need you to continue to show the mercy and love of Jesus to us. Amen. How many can say amen to that? Can we say that? Can we say that to moms? Amen. But we also need you to discipline us in his love too. We need you to say, no, you didn't. Right? We need you to say, no, we need that. Can I ask you this? Since I've already gone long, right? And uh, we don't need to eat more. Okay? We already got that down. Can I ask a favor here? I'm going to ask something really hard. I'm going to ask you young people or younger, it depends, you know, all of us, I'm young, right? It's all relative. But can I ask the younger girls to go right now to, a, to either your mom or to an older lady and to pray for them? Could I ask you to do that? And can I ask the guys to follow the girls and kind of just lay hands? Don't pray, guys, don't mess it up. But just, can I ask you to just pray for the younger ladies? Go because older ladies, they, it's their day. Let them sit, right? And go to them. And pray for them to really God would awaken them to be disciples, disciplers of younger women. Will you pray that? You hear that? And then would you then turn around and then you older women pray for the younger women to be humble and to welcome your discipleship. Can we do that? Can we do that for three or, three or four minutes? Can we do that? Is that too scary? Let's go. Come on. Amen. How many can say that wasn't too scary? Amen. You still coming back next week? That's good. Amen. Yeah, that's good. And that's what we used to do in the old days. We used to actually pray for each other and talk to each other. It's really weird, but it's a, we need to bring it back. Amen. <laughs> so anyway, but anyways, real quick, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for the moms, and I want to pray. Father, thank you so much for the older, seasoned women of this church, if that's the right word. But Lord, just thank you for the mature women of this church. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them. I pray that in their golden years, they would not just use it for self, but they would say, hey, Lord, there was ladies who came alongside me. Now I want to, in a sense, pay it forward. I want to give back what is so given to me. As you, your word says that those who refresh others, they themselves should be refreshed. That they would say, Lord, I want to bless others like I've been blessed. So Lord, bless the older, mature women of this church to really pour in, to look for women that need that encouragement, that need that love, that need that mother, that maybe don't even have a mother, or at least a mother here, that they could really say, hey, I want to have that that mother heart of God to minister to the young women of this church. Father, I also pray for the young women of this church, young married women and women that are going to be married someday soon, that they would be open to hearing, that they'd be humble to hear from older women some of the pitfalls, some of the hardships they've gone through, some of the, the, the tricks of the trade, if I could say that, that they would say, hey, here's what I've learned. Here's what's helped me to, how to show respect or submission to my husband. I ask God that you would bless this church, that this would be a church not of just trying to be big, but it'd be a church of discipleship, amen? A church where we spur one another on to love and good deeds, where we come alongside each other and we really feel connected, not because we have a cool coffee bar or a great patio, but because we really love you and we really love each other with your love. And I pray this, Lord, even though it's not Father's Day, but Lord, bless the men. Let the older men come alongside the younger men and let the younger men be open 
to hear the wisdom spoken through you to, through these older men. Bless our church. Let it be the way you called it to be. Koinonia, fellowship, intimacy, closeness. Bless this house. Let it be your house. Let it be your church. And let us have a taste of heaven here on earth as it will be in heaven. We love you and thank you. And we bless every mom here, no matter what they're going through. If they're, they've had a hard, uh, maybe they, they're, they're, there's a son or daughter that's away from them. Lord, bind up their broken heart and let them be overwhelmed with your loving kindness. Let them know that you love them and you're there for them. Bless every mom here in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone agreed said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Thank you, guys. Down deep in my soul Down deep